Hello everyone, it's Flight Insight Private Pilot Ground School Class 13 Plan a Cross Country Flight. Today's the day. We're going to take everything we've learned so far and put it together in planning a flight between College Park, Maryland and Hagerstown, Maryland. These two airports are just over 50 miles straight line distance away, so this flight satisfies that requirement to have a certain amount of cross country flight experience because any of those flights over 50 miles count towards your cross country experience. So this is a great first cross country flight if you're departing from an airport like College Park. So let's dive right in. First of all, let's take a look at all the materials that we're gonna need to complete this cross country plan. So first of all, we're gonna need a cross country navigation log or a nav log. And this is one of the files that's provided along with the course. One of the PDFs provided in the course files. It's also provided in Excel format, whichever you're most comfortable using when you're filling this out. But this is where we're gonna put all of the actual information that we're coming up to, like the checkpoints, the headings, the time and route, information on the airports, the weather, the weight and balance, etc. This is our playbook. This is what we're actually gonna use when we're in the aircraft. And so we're going to be putting all of the planning items into this as we go. Next is the Washington sectional chart. This is the aviation chart that we're going to refer to for this flight because the entire route of flight is covered on this sectional chart for the Washington area. These sectional charts can be purchased online for about $8 or you can access them electronically for free on, Sky, on websites like skyvector.com. They'll, they'll have it out there with some other information overlaid, but I recommend definitely picking up a sectional chart, at least for the area that you're going to be operating in. You have to have some kind of charts on you when you're flying around. Next is the E6B flight computer. So for this course today, we're going to be using the excellent online simulator from the University of North Dakota. Uh, there's a link there uh, if you want to follow along yourself on that simulator to the uh, UND Aero program. They'll have that up there. Or you can use your own uh, hard copy E6B if you have one of those as well. Next is the POH for the Cessna 172 Papa model. Uh, this is another PDF that's provided in the course files, but a big word of caution, make sure that you're only using that file for classroom use or for uh, you know planning out use like we're doing today. If you're taking an aircraft up, you're gonna be referring to the POH specific to that aircraft. So don't use any of the files in this course and then go flying your own uh, aircraft with it. They're specific to the aircraft. Same thing with the next item here, the empty weight and balance. This is going to be a certified empty weight and balance that is specific to the aircraft. So when you're flying your own aircraft, you'll have your own uh, empty weight and balance sheet to uh, refer your or, or to base your weight and balance decisions off of. And then finally is the Northeast U.S. Chart Supplement. This is going to have all of the extra information for uh, on airports, etc., that you can't find off of the sectional chart. And again, a PDF for this is going to be provided in the courses. So we'll be referring to all of these items uh, today in this cross-country flight plan. Our first task is to figure out the route for the flight. So let's start by looking at the sectional chart. And here we're looking at part of the Washington sectional chart for the area that we're flying. And let's look at our departure and destination airport. So you see College Park right at the bottom there, and then Hagerstown at the top and the left. So the first step is identifying the beginning and the ending parts of the flights. Next, let's connect these two airports with a line. If you have a sectional chart that you're using yourself, take a straight edge, take the straight edge from the E6B or, or a plotter or anything that you have, and just draw a line, maybe in pencil so that it's easy to erase. But this is going to be our starting point, right? The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So if we can conduct this flight along that straight line, that's our best option. That, that's the shortest route between these two points. So now that we have that route picked out and we can actually visualize what that straight line is, let's start to figure out if and why that might not be a good idea. If there's things that make that direct route not so suitable. Well, one thing jumps right out at us. We're starting this flight in the flight restricted zone. That's that area around the uh, uh, downtown Washington, D.C., or, or specifically it's around National Airport just across the river. But that flight restricted zone is basically what it sounds like. You can't really stay in there too long. Now, we're departing from College Park, so we will need a special flight plan just to depart from that airport at all. But 
notice that that direct route to Hagerstown was going to have us kind of cut through a lot of that airspace in the flight restricted zone. They don't like that. They like you to use the shortest route in and out of the flight restricted zone that you possibly can. So we're going to do that. We're going to plot our first leg of the course being the shortest distance right out, almost straight to the north out of College Park. And then once we're out of there, we'll continue along that route. So we'll amend our route just for the flight restricted zone, and then we'll see if there's anything else that would kind of cause us to continue or to further amend that route. Well, let's look at altitudes and airspace. So the only airspace to talk about is Bravo for now. When we depart College Park, we'll be in either G or E airspace because it's an uncontrolled airfield. But notice that we're underneath the Bravo for BWI, National, and Dulles a good distance out uh, from the beginning of this flight. But notice the altitude restrictions. Once we're in that ring uh, outside of the flight restricted zone, we're going to be underneath the 2,500 restriction of the Bravo. So as long as we stay below that altitude, we'll be okay. As well as as you continue a little bit to the northwest, you see that we'll enter the 3,500 ring. So yeah, there is Bravo airspace that if we wanted to get up in there, we would need a clearance and that might complicate our flight. So we'd like to stay out of it. But that Bravo doesn't begin until 2,500. So that doesn't mean that this route is no good. It might mean that we might need to think about what altitudes we want to fly. But just because of the Bravo, we're not going to change this route of flight. Now, as you continue a little further to the northwest here, you see that there's another airspace. There's Delta airspace right over that airport. That's Frederick Airport in Maryland. And the Delta, you can see from the symbol, goes from the surface to 2,800 feet. So again, there, there's no reason why we can't have our course cut through that circle. It's just a matter of if we don't want to go in the delta, we're going to have to fly above that altitude. That's no problem. We can outclimb 2,800 feet all day long. And even if we didn't want to do that, it's a little easier to transition through a delta airspace than it is through a Bravo. So neither one of these things is going to cause us to amend our route of flight for this. Now, what's that scary thing just to the right of course there? It's P40R4009. Now, like any special use airspace on the chart, you can go to the bottom of the sectional chart and they'll tell you about it. Now, what this is, starting with the P40, is that there's a prohibited area that you can't go into under any circumstances that goes up to but doesn't include 5,000 feet. So it's from the surface up to 5,000 MSL. And it also says that it underlies that other R4009 airspace. And the info on that one says that that goes from 5,000 up to 12,500. So you've got kind of a prohibited area with a restricted area stacked on top of it within the radius of that circle, about three, four miles. Now, what that is, that's Camp David. Um, it's going to be just to the right of our course, and as long as we stay on that black line we drew, we'll stay clear of both the P-40 and the 4009. But notice the white circle with the, with the big thick dashes on the outside of it around that restricted area and that prohibited area. What that means, it doesn't mean that you can't fly through there, but it means that when this airspace is active, in other words, when the president is in residence at Camp David, the restrictions will uh, go out in radius from Camp David. So they'll go from that circle all the way out to encompass the entire white circle. Now, we kind of know that anyways, anytime the president or the vice president is operating, because they have a 10-mile ring that's basically no fly around them, followed by a 30-mile ring around them that's heavily restricted. So uh, it... it it might be a little redundant just to say that, yeah, if the president is at Camp David, you can't fly within that white circle because of the nature of this restricted area, but just also because of the nature of these temporary flight restrictions that go up around VIPs, as they call them. So we'll take note of that uh, just because it's close to our route of flight, but we don't need to amend our route of flight to stay away from it. Now that we've got our routes set up, we can start to put together the cross-country navigation log. So we pull that up and we can just work left to right on here. So we'll start with the checkpoints and these are gonna be the visual landmarks that we're gonna to use to conduct pilotage across the route of flight. So 
what we'll do is we'll look at the sectional chart along the route of flight that we drew out and we'll pick out landmarks that make sense. Now there's no such thing as like a perfect landmark or, or a right or a wrong landmark, but basic ideas are you want them to be visible from flight and easily recognizable and you want them to be spaced a good distance away. So a good distance is something where when you're on top of one landmark, you can see the next landmark. So you don't have to kind of go hunting to find that next landmark or along the route of flight. But you don't want them so close together that you're constantly going to have to be sort of on top of each one as you're flying along there. So know, maybe about 8 to 10 miles out for the speeds that we're going to fly are going to work. So if we pull up the sectional chart in a route of flight, we can start picking some points out. So the first one is going to be the end of our first little leg, that little jog that we're using to get out of the flight restricted zone right there. And you can see that there's an intersection of a highway here and a highway here. So that's I-95 and the inner county connector, the Maryland Highway. So where those two intersect, that's going to be our point that we'll know that we've exited the flight restricted zone on our route of flight here. So we can start getting these in. So the first one is going to be uh, College Park and then we'll have the inner county connector or I-95 and where that meets the inter county connector. Now as we're doing this you could put them into the the, uh, the the checkpoints in the nav log but it's also good to start calling these things out along the sectional as well because you're gonna have that sectional chart with you so mark those off put a put a little line or an X through that whatever makes sense for you just so that you're identifying these all right so now that we've come to that point let's continue northwest along the main route of the flight here and start picking some things out so the first thing that stands out is as you're continuing along this route here's an intersection of a road here going north south and then a set of power lines going east-west. I really like power lines as a um, landmark because they cut through trees and, and stuff like that. You can see them from, for a long distance and those towers that hold up the, that support the wires are visible too. So that's in the city of Olney here in Maryland. That'll be the intersection between the road here, which is Georgia Avenue and those power lines. So we'll put a mark there on the chart for that one. And then continuing further along here, now you do see an airport, you do see Davis Airfield, but airfields, airports, especially smaller ones, don't make great landmarks because you can't typically see them until you're right on top of it. So again, we want to be able to see it, not when we're on top of it here, but when we're actually over that first landmark or that or that last, uh, the, 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 the landmark that we just flew over. So let's use something that's a little bit more recognizable. You see this city here, and it's listed as the city of Damascus. Well, when we overfly that populated area there, we'll know that we're at that uh, waypoint. So that's a lot more recognizable. So we'll call out Damascus as our next point. And then from there, in this, by the same token, we've got a much bigger uh, populated area here in the city of Frederick, Maryland. Now, yeah, there is an airport there, so maybe I can break my rule a little bit, but it's a fairly large airport. I mean, you see the uh, array of runways there. There's two of them. The longest one is 5,200 feet. So this is going to have a little bit more of a landmark value to it than like a Davis Airfield will. So we'll use the city and the airport as landmarks for uh, this checkpoint over Frederick. All right, and then at leaving Frederick, we start to get into a little bit of mountains here. There's two mountain ridges, one here and one here. They're not big ones, but they're visible because of the uh, relative flatness of the rest of the areas, you know, just some mild hills. So coming along there, one thing you notice is that we're kind of running parallel with I-70, which is coming out of Frederick. So that's a good just sort of way to see that we're staying close to our route is that we're parallel with that highway and we're just a few miles to the right of it or to the northeast of it. But as far as a checkpoint, you see in this valley here, there's another set of power lines that we're going to be crossing. So that's a great one. Just right in the mountain valley, you've got the power lines. And then from there, it's not too much further along to get to Hagerstown. We can see, once we pass this ridge, the city of Hagerstown. And then just beyond that is going to be the airport. So we'll use that as our final landmark. All right, so now that we've got these, we can put the rest of these checkpoints into our nav log. So we already got I-95 and the ICC. The next one was going to be only, and then we said that was where that road, which is Georgia Avenue, intersects with the uh, power lines. 
and then just to just to remind you what what that is right here here that is right here all right and then we'll put damascus frederick and the mountain valley in as the rest of the waypoints damascus frederick and then if we want to sort of call out the airport we can put fdk as well and then that mountain valley and power lines these are the catoctin mountains by the way and power lines and then from there it's straight on to our destination of hagerstown so we got the checkpoints in. we've got our beginning and ending airports and then we've got all the intermediate waypoints and again we've got them checked off on our sectional chart so we're going to have both of these things the sectional chart with the checkpoints ticked off and the nav log with the checkpoints written out on there so that we can use this for navigation now we can start putting altitudes in for the route of flight. Now notice how the nav log is set up. So you have sets of checkpoints like this first leg that starts at College Park and then goes to I-95 and the Intercounty Connector. And then the rest of the nav log kind of has their rows sort of straddling those two or it's in between the two. And that's because this information is going to apply not to a single checkpoint, but it's going to apply to the leg between those two checkpoints. So for example, if I put an altitude in this box here, it's going to be the altitude I'm going to fly between College Park and that I-95 Intercounty Connector uh, landmark. So we'll start putting in altitudes. And we, you know, we've already got an idea of what we're doing here, right? We want to make sure that we're staying out of Bravo airspace while still giving us plenty of altitude to be compliant with like terrain and obstruction clearance and everything like that. So let's start looking at the chart for ideas of what we're actually going to fly when we're up top. So here's the first route of flight. And remember that we said that we're starting at College Park, which is inside, you can't see it on this chart, but it's inside the 1500 ring of the Bravo. But as soon as you cross that little line there, we're in the 2500 ring, right? And that goes for, and, that, and that's the same even after we cross the flight restricted zone. So maybe the first altitude we climb to coming out of College Park it will be 2000 feet because we'll be outside of that 1500 ring and we can climb to 2000. Now continuing along, you could see that that Bravo ring of 2500 sort of ends here and then we're in the 3500 ring of the Bravo. So we can climb to 3000 feet. Now, what would we climb to if it wasn't for the Bravo? Remember that if you're on a westbound flight, you want to be at even thousands of feet plus 500. So ideally we'd be at something like 4,500 or 6,500, but you can't do 4,500 until you're outside of that ring of the Bravo, which is right at that line at Damascus. So we'll start at 2,000 and then we'll go up to three for these uh, legs here that end at Damascus. And then from Damascus, we'll climb to 4,500. And we know that that'll keep us out of any kind of trouble with terrain and airspace because the only airspace to worry about is this delta going forward, which is at 2,800. And then terrain-wise, you've got your MEFs, right? Here's one at 28, here's one at 23, 21. Basically, what that means is that as long as I stay a good distance uh, above those altitudes, I'll be okay. 4,500 accomplishes that just fine. So once we get past Damascus, we'll have our final altitude in of 4,500 feet. So let's get those populated in. We've got the first altitude at 2,000 followed by 3,000, which is going to take us all the way to Damascus. And then it's at Damascus, once we leave there, that will be good to climb up to our final altitude of 4,500 feet. So there's the altitudes for the, for the flight. Okay, continuing to move left to right on the nav log, now we've got VOR and OBS. VOR is that ground-based radio navigation that we're going to use, and then OBS is omni-bearing selector. This is going to get to how we're going to use the VOR in flight. Now these next two items are somewhat optional. If you're flying in an area where VOR navigation isn't really going to help on the route of flight, you can ignore it, or you can use it just for the portion of flight where it is going to be helpful. Let's take a look at the sectional though, and let's see if we can use VORs to sort of back up our pilotage and dead reckoning on this flight. So if we look at the sectional chart, and all we need to do is kind of kink the route of flight just a tiny bit to the left a little, and what that's going to do is it's going to have us overfly the airport of Frederick. And Frederick has a VOR station located on the field, as evidenced by the Compass Rose, 10 miles away or uh, around. 
uh, the airport and then the identifier right here. So the Frederick VOR is a great uh, radio uh, nav aid to help us uh, navigate because we can either be navigating to the VOR station or away from the VOR station on a specific radial. So what are those radials? So now if we have a look at the compass rows on here, we can kind of get an idea of what we're going to need to fly. So the first one on here, you see it kind of crossing about, oh, I don't know, what do we call that, 143 maybe, if that's 150. So it's not that we're going to be flying 143 to get inbound. We're flying along that radial, but the heading, notice, is going to be the reciprocal because we're flying in this direction. We're flying northwest bound. Now, once you get to Frederick, we're going to be flying the same direction almost entirely, but it's a completely different radial as you see here. So you see that the radial we're crossing, or the radial that we're going to be using to get between Frederick and Hagerstown, just one hash mark to the left of 330 is going to put it on the 325 radial. So what that basically means is that if we navigate on a 325 degree heading and we use that in the OBS to get us both to Frederick and then to navigate away from Frederick, that'll take us along this line that we've drawn uh, from that point that kinks at I-95 all the way to Hagerstown. So what we can do is we can put that radial into each one of the legs for the flight of 325. And then we can also get the VOR information in there. So looking at the box here, the identifier is FDK. So we'll put that in the nav log and it'll populate. Now I, I did this, you can do this by hand if you want, but it'll populate the Morse identifier on here and you can sort of verify that that's correct just by having a look at the dots and the dashes in the box. And then the frequency is the last thing we'll want to put in there, that 109.0 will also put in and then we can just kind of carry that down through the rest of our nav log here since we're going to use that for each one of our legs of flight. Now when I finish this I want to change one thing because remember that the entire flight isn't going to be along that 325 radial. We're actually doing that little kink to stay out of the flight restricted zone. So I'm going to get rid of this VOR information for that first leg, right? Because that first leg of the flight is taking us between College Park and that point outside the flight restricted zone. We're not going to use the VORs for that, but the rest of the flight we can use the VORs for. So let's have that in there for our own help in, uh, in navigating. The next item on the nav log is to get our winds aloft information. That's going to help us figure out what our ground speed is and what our wind correction angle needs to be. So we can get our winds aloft information off of aviationweather.gov. So here we'll have that homepage pulled up. And if we go into forecasts and we go winds temps, and then we scroll down to the wind temps data chart here, we'll click on our area of the country, and then we get this table here. So now we want to figure out which one of the VOR stations listed here applies to the route of flight. So we can go back to the sectional and kind of get a clue on that. Now let's look at some VORs. So uh, obviously Frederick is a VOR we're going to pass. Some other ones on here are Westminster, EMI. That's a little bit uh, of a more prominent VOR. And if you look on here, EMI is listed as one of the VORs where you have a wind forecast, whereas Frederick isn't. So EMI is, while it's not directly uh, underneath our route of flight, it's pretty close. So we'll use the winds aloft information for EMI or Westminster. So now starting at 3,000 feet, we'll see that the winds are 230 degrees at 12 knots. And by the way, we're using the current uh, information, but you can sort of uh, have a look out a little bit in the future of the forecast for this too. But we'll, we'll pretend we're doing this flight uh, as soon as we're done with the homework here. So the uh, winds at 3,000 feet at Westminster are going to be 230 degrees at 12 knots. So we can put that in to our nav log. So we'll have 230 at, uh, what did I say, 12 knots. We'll have that up there. And now look, notice the altitudes, right? Because the altitudes on the 
wins a law of chart go in multiples of, or go in intervals of 3,000, go 3,000, 6,000. So basically that's great for us because we're going to stay at 3,000 feet all the way up until Damascus. So we'll use the 3,000 foot winds of law forecast all the way up through there. But now let's have a look because we're climbing up to 4,500 thereafter and the winds are showing a little bit different. Now notice it's 280 at 19 knots, but that's at 6,000 feet. We're not going to 6,000 feet. We're only going to 4,500. So we're going halfway in between 3,000 and 600. So why don't we do this? Why don't we take the average between the two? So if we pull up the calculator and we say our first heading is 230 and our second heading is 280, and then really it's just a matter of, well, first it's a matter of typing correctly. <laughs> and then it's a matter of taking the average between the two so that'll be a direction of 255 that we'll put in here and then as far as wind speed we can do the same thing we're talking the average between 12 knots and 19 knots so once again 12 plus 19 divided by 2 let's call it 15 knots just so that we get rid of the decimal so there we have it and we can use those winds aloft information for the remainder of the flight since we're staying at 4500 all the way up until we get to our airport for the descent to land. Next we're looking at our true airspeed. Now there's going to be times when we're fast and times when we're slow because part of the flight we're going to be climbing, part of the flight we're going to be cruising. So we're going to use the pilot's operating handbook to figure out what speeds we're going to fly at, but we're going to need to keep in mind that whether we're climbing or cruising, we're going to need to use different charts in the POH. So let's have a look at the POH. Here it is here, and what we're looking for is the performance section, which is section 5. So we'll scroll through, and again, this is the file that's provided in the supplement to the course, so you can use this exact thing and we'll find the performance charts for we'll start with the climb chart because we're interested in what our speed is going to be in the climb uh, okay so here we are time fuel and distance to climb and what we're looking at is the indicated airspeed for the climb so let's zoom in a bit and we're starting at around sea level now, we're not at exact sea level at College Park, but in terms of are we closer to sea level or 1,000 feet in pressure altitude, we're closer to sea level. So we'll start with that, and we're going to climb up to 2,000 feet. So basically from sea level to 2,000 feet is going to give us a climb speed of 75 knots. So we'll put that in there for now. Now we're going to have to change that because it's not indicated airspeed, so we'll have to amend that in a second. But let's just put that in there uh, for now, and then we'll, we'll play with it later. Now that we're up at our altitude, at 2,000 feet, we can start looking at the cruise speeds. Now, yeah, we are going to have to do a 1,000-foot climb once we get to I-95 in the ICC, but let's ignore that, and let's just say that from the time we reach the, the uh, point outside the flight-restricted zone, we're going to be at our cruise airspeed. So let's look at what that cruise airspeed is going to be. So this is going to be a different chart in the pilot operating handbook, and we'll look at our cruise performance. So let's assume standard temperature. And again, we can look at our weather for the route of flight to really find out what our temperature is going to be. Uh, but let's actually assume that we're going to be around standard. I and mean, if you don't believe me, we can go into aviationweather.gov, and we'll look at the METAR for College Park just to show what the weather is currently doing and if we're way far off in our assumption of standard temperatures but here's college park i guess the uh, METAR is down so we'll use a uh, we'll use a nearby one at tipton uh, fort mead which is just north of college park all right that's giving us a temperature of 24 celsius so it's a little bit more than standard because standard is 15 degrees celsius at uh sea level but look at the choices, either standard or 20 degrees. So we could we could slice and dice, or let's just take standard temperature, just to keep it, it simple for now. Now our altitude that we're going to be climbing at, or cruising at, is 3,000 feet. 
So notice the acronym, knots true airspeed. We don't have to do any kind of adjustment to that to get it from indicated to true airspeed. So let's take an assumption that we're gonna cruise at 2400 RPM. If we were at 2000 feet pressure altitude, we'd be at 109 knots. If we were at 4000 feet pressure altitude, <clears throat> we'd be at 108 knots. We're at 3,000, so we're between 108 and 109. We could take the average and just to lop the decimal off there, we'll say our true airspeed or our uh, true airspeed in the cruise is going to be 108. And we'll carry that number through all the way until we get to the climb. And remember that we're going to have to climb again between Damascus and Frederick, and that's a little bit more sizable of a climb going up 1500 feet so let's smooth out our numbers a little bit and let's take an average between the two and say that okay maybe we'll climb for half that leg and we'll cruise the other half the leg so if we take the average between 75 and 108 and we'll say 92 knots is what we'll do on that leg but then the remaining legs we'll be back in cruise 108. Now remember, we said that when we looked at the airspeed for the climb between College Park and that first waypoint, that was given to us in knots indicated airspeed. So we're gonna have to convert that to true airspeed. Remember, there's a difference because as the air gets thinner, the indication is gonna read slower and slower than the actual or the true airspeed. So we're gonna use the E6B and a little bit of weather information to figure out what our true airspeed in the climb is, if it's indicating 75. All right, so let's bring up the E6B and just to remind ourselves, right, what we're gonna be looking for on here is to set the pressure altitude opposite the degrees Celsius in the window, that being this window, and then opposite calibrated airspeed or indicated airspeed we can use either or on the inner scale we'll read the true airspeed on the outer scale all right so step one here is going to be to figure out the pressure altitude and the temperature now we've already kind of done this right the temperature is 24 degrees at the surface the pressure altitude that we're going to need the altimeter setting remember standard pressure is 2992 the altimeter setting at Tipton is 2988, so it's almost standard. So we can go ahead and just take our altitude, which is close to sea level, and just call that our pressure altitude. So that makes it easy. Pressure altitude of zero, and then a temperature of 24. So let's zoom in here, and let's spin the wheel. And what we're going to do is we're going to get the zero figure for uh, pressure altitude on top of the 24 degrees, which is... Uh, 5, 10, 20, that's 25. So we'll basically put the zero right around there. So I'll spin that a little. I'm going to have to count this out, or otherwise my, I'm going to go cross-eyed. 10, 20, and just shy of 25 gives us 24. So we've got that spun, and now what we need to do, remember the instructions, it says opposite calibrated airspeed on inner scale, read true airspeed. So our calibrated or indicated airspeed was 75, and there's 75 right there. And lo and behold, the true airspeed isn't a whole lot different. It's 76. When you think about that, it's a little bit hotter. So the air is a little bit less dense than it would be in standard conditions, and that means that in order to get the 75 knots indicated, we have to fly a little bit faster. We have to fly 76 knots true airspeed. It's not a huge change, but at least that's the theory in practice. Now, you may have noted that when we came up with this 92 figure, we used that 75 and the 108 and we did an average. Let's ignore making a correction for that now just because there was only a one knot difference between our indicated airspeed and our true airspeed. So now we're done with the true airspeed column here. Next we're going to want to figure out what direction to point this aircraft once it's up in the air. So we're going to need to figure out our true course and then adjust that for winds and magnetic variation and then compass deviations to get to our compass heading. And in the process we're also going to be able to figure out what our ground speeds are. This is going to be where the E6B comes into play, but the first step before we go to that is to figure out our true course. 
So we'll pull up the chart here and we're going to use our plotter to figure out what the course is on each one of these two legs here. So the first one is that first little jog to get out of the flight restricted zone. We'll put the plotter right on top of the uh, the point where the, uh, the, 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 uh, the flight starts at College Park. Make sure that it's aligned in this case with the latitude line. So that 90 and 270 line are right on top of that latitude line. And then we can read the true course off of there. So it's going to be 10 degrees for that first leg. And we do the exact same thing for the remaining legs. And we'll get a true course of 315. So we can start putting that in in our true course column. So the first one is going to be 10 degrees or 010 to do it more properly. And then the remaining ones are going to be 315 all the way through until we get to Hagerstown. All right, so now we need to figure out what our wind correction angle is. So this is where the E6B comes into play. So let's pull that up and now we're going to need the wind side of it, right? And so let's start by putting this on uh, the putting the center part right on the 100 and then we'll start reading the instructions. Instruction one is set wind direction under true index. Our wind direction is 230 so we'll spin the wheel and get 230 underneath the true index. Step two is going to be to mark the wind velocity up from the center point. There's our velocity at 12 knots so we'll mark that right around there. Step three is to set the true course under the true index. Now our first true course is 0, 010. So we'll spin that wheel and get 0, 010 under true index. And then we're going to need to slide that wind velocity mark that we put up to the true airspeed. So we figured our true airspeed at 76. So we're going to slide this until that red dot is right on top of 76. And then we can read two things. First we can read our ground speed which reads under center. And you can see it right there at 85 there. And then we can read our wind correction angle. It reads between the center line and the wind velocity mark. And let's zoom in just so it's a little clearer. And you see, let's count each little line is two degrees from the center line. So negative two, negative four, negative six. It's a six degree wind correction from the left and it's an 85 knot ground speed. So we could put that in here. We have negative six for our wind correction angle. And then all the way on the right here, we could put our ground speed of 85. Now we're gonna need to do this for each one of our legs because the information is a little bit different. I'm gonna spare you the last ones, but let's just do one more just to get that out of the way. So we'll go back to the E6B and reset. We'll put the center line right over 100. I don't think it'll let me get rid of the, the red line on here, so we'll just change that later. Zoom out so we get our instructions. It says set wind direction under true index. The wind direction is 230. There that is. The wind velocity was 12, and we'll put that in. And make sure I get it somewhat close. And we'll zoom in and make sure I got it. And one, two, right around there. Okay, fair enough. And set true course under true index. So now our true course is 315. It's changed since we're on that second leg of the flight. So we'll turn that to 315 and then it's going to have us slide the wind velocity mark up to our true airspeed. Our true airspeed is now 108 since we're in cruise. So we'll slide this up to 108 right around there and two things we'll get off of here are, zoom up, there let's scroll up. Uh, we'll get our ground speed which reads on the center and then we'll get the wind correction angle which reads between the center line and the wind velocity mark. So there's our ground speed right around 106 and our wind correction angle. There's the five degree mark. So it's just about six, we'll, 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 we'll call it six degrees just to keep it consistent. So we'll put those in. We have a left wind correction angle of six degrees, so negative six, and then now our ground speed 
is 106. Now it's always good to reality check these, right? Think of your true course and think of the winds. Our true course is 315, so we're almost like due northwest in this case, and the winds are coming out of the southwest. So they're going to be off our left side, so it makes sense that we have a left correction in, and they're slightly behind us. You could do the math here, and, and you have to subtract a little bit more than perpendicular 90 degrees to get from 315 to 230. So the wind is coming from the left and a tiny little bit behind us, and uh, or actually, you know what, I take that back. It is a tiny bit in front of us, right? The difference between 315 and 230, this is what I get for trying to do math in my head on the fly here. But if I take my course 315 and my wind direction at 230, look at that. The difference is 85. Okay. What that means is that the wind is just barely a little bit in front of me. It's not quite off my left side completely. And that sort of bears out in the fact that the ground speed of 106 is less than the airspeed of 108. So that kind of stuff is a good reality check. Just make sure you're not screwing up the numbers like I almost just did. All right, so I'll save you the hassle of doing the rest of these computations, and I'll put them in, but I calculated them the exact same way that we've done the other ones on here. So we'll have all of those on here. Uh, th this one's unchanged. This one, where we're going 92 knots, changes the ground speed and the wind correction angle slightly and then the remainings are right back to the old uh, uh, you know what let's see we got 84 here negative 8 and then we're back at 108 and because the winds are stronger up here we're using 100 knots ground speed Apologies for the uh, for the for the delay here. I want to make sure we get the numbers correct. All right, so we've got our wind correction angle and our ground speeds in there. So now the true heading is just the true course plus or minus the wind correction angle. So here it's just 10 degrees minus six is going to give us our true heading of 004, and we'll do that same math out for these other figures as well to get our true headings. Okay, the next step is going to be to figure out the variation, the magnetic variation. And this one's a little easier because all we have to do is we have to look at that isogonic line there, 11 degrees west. Remember, east is least, west is best, so we're going to add 11 degrees to the true heading. And this is going to apply for each leg, so it's easier. That's our variation. And then it's just a matter of adding these together the true heading of 4 degrees and the variation of 11 degrees to get our magnetic heading. First it's 0, 1, 5 and then the rest of them are simple addition too. Alright, so we've got our magnetic headings in there and then the last step is going to be to get our magnetic deviation. The compass card is going to help us with this. It has the corrections that need to be made for any heading that you're trying to fly. So the first heading we're trying to fly is 015 and you sort of see in here that it's sort of a tweener one, right? It's about halfway between north, or it is exactly halfway between north and 30 degrees. So it's either going to be a correction of 0 or 3. So let's split the difference. Let's call it a 2 degree, a negative 2 degree compass correction. Now uh, we'll just put negative two, make it easy. Uh, and then for the rest of them, they're all all of these magnetic headings are roughly 320. So we'll use here we are. We have the difference between 300 and 330. It's either going to be a three degree addition or a two degree addition. Let's call it a two degree addition, and we'll have that be our uh, magnetic deviation for the remaining legs of the flight here. Alright, and then it's just a matter of adding them up. And notice this one is the big category because this is what we're actually going to use in flight to navigate.
So adding up the magnetic heading and the magnetic deviation gives us the compass heading. This is what we actually want the compass to show when we're in flight. So step by step here, we've come to really the first big piece of information we need, which is the compass heading to get us between each one of these leg points. Let's figure out our leg distance for each one of these legs on the nav log now. We'll use the sectional again, and we can take our plotter and overlay it on the route of flight. Now, big word of caution here, make sure you're using the right scale on your plotter or on your straight edge of your E6B. A lot of the, there, there's different ones out there and they'll have different scales. So the one that we're looking for for the sectional chart is the one to 500,000 scale. And I'll say sectional chart on there, but you know, line it up with the uh, hashes on the longitude line and just make sure that they match up, that you've got the correct scale when you're doing these out. And then we're just gonna use that to write down the distance for each one of these legs, both uh, on the, uh, the main portion and then that little jog portion as well, so that we can start to get these written down. So we'll go into our nav log and we have that first one was six miles and then just kind of going through here, you see where, where we're looking. You've got the first one is six miles and then 10 followed by nine, etc. So we'll start putting those in. We have 10, we have nine, we have 12, we have 14 and 10. And then we can sort of check ourselves and we can add all these up and we should be able to come out with the total distance that you can check if you use your plotter. Let's see, 24, 36, 45, yeah, that, that'll work, 61 miles right there. So, um, that's our leg distance. We've got each one of the legs and we've got the total distance so that now we can start working out the amount of time it's going to take us to get uh, from point A to point B. And next we'll figure out our estimated time en route, our ETE, that's in this column here. So we've got the two pieces of information we need for that. We have our leg distance and our ground speed. So distance equals rate times time, that's how we'll figure this out. And we can make it easier, we can use the slide rule side of the E6B. So let's do this first leg. How long is it going to take us to go six miles if we're doing 85 knots? So on the E6B, what we can do is we can set our rate arrow to that rate of 85 knots. And once we've done that, we can look at how many miles it is that we want to know about, right? We don't care about 85 miles. We know how long that's going to take us, 60 minutes. How long is it going to take us to go only six miles? So we'll look here. There's no six on here, but we use the 60 and just lop a zero off. And you notice that it's halfway between what we would call four and 4.5. So it's about let's call it four minutes just to kind of round down so that's going to be our first figure here is four minutes for that very first leg and then we can kind of continue this out let's look at the next one it's 106 knots in 10 miles so we'll set 60 here to 106 knots and then we're interested in 10 miles right here so that 10 miles comes here uh, it's between five and a half and six minutes, so let's call it six minutes. Make it just a little easier. So we'll put six minutes in here, and now we can do the same thing. And now it's the same speed, so we don't have to spin this. It's still on 106 knots, but now we're interested in how long it's going to take us to go nine miles. So here's nine miles, and you see that that's closer to five minutes, so we'll use the five minute there for that one. So now we'll change the speed again to put 84 as the speed, 84 knots for this leg. That's what we computed the ground speed as. And then we're interested in how long it's going to take us to go 12 miles at that speed. So here's the 12 miles and you see it's just a little bit closer to the nine minute figure. So we'll put nine minutes in for that leg. And then finally we'll set this to 100 knots, that's our final ground speed that we computed, and we're interested in 14 miles the amount of time, and it looks like it's a little closer to 8 minutes. And then we're interested in 10 miles. Well, guess what, if we do 100 miles in, uh, or I'm sorry, if, yeah, if we do 100 miles in 60 minutes, we divide that uh, by 10, that 60 minutes becomes 6 minutes. You can do that in your head. Uh, but it's basically right there. You just lop the zeros off. 
and that gives us our time in root. You can add these up too if you wanted, and you'd have, let's see, it would be uh, 6 plus 8 is um, 14, uh, plus 9 gives you 23, plus 5 gives you 28, plus 6 gives you 34, plus 4 gives you 38 minutes. So that's our total flight time to get between College Park and Hagerstown using the route of flight that we planned out here. There it is. Now what you can do in flight, just prior to taking off on the runway, you can put the actual time that you depart. And rather than using ETE, we can use ETA. The difference being that we'll know based on the time of day that we depart, what time we can expect to arrive. So let's say we take off at 1 p.m. We'll put the time off there and then we can start populating these in just by doing the math here, right? So if you leave at one and then you fly four minutes, at 1.04, you'll be at your next destination or, or your next uh, point on the, uh, the, the, the nav log and, vi and uh, so on and so forth. And there we have it, right? A 38 minute trip that starts at one o'clock is going to end at 138. So that's all that.